Hello, on this video we're going to uh, talk about handout 11, uh, which is actually going to cover three topics, collision theory, activation energy, and catalysis. And you've actually seen collision theory before, you've heard of collision theory before last semester, we talked about it. Um, and collision theory is uh, what we put together as the essential things that need to happen for a reaction to occur. So it's the observations of every time we see a reaction happening, what are things that those reactions must have in order to succeed. And there's three general postulates in that theory. And the reason I'm talking about collision theory is because we're talking about the rate of a reaction. And, and that's the kinetics part. And we're gonna continue on in the next handout talking about equilibrium, which is the next part of a reaction. And so both of those things depend on the reaction actually happening. And so for those, for you get to get the rate of a reaction or to get a reaction to happen at a certain speed, um, you have to have these requirements met. The rate of a reaction is proportional to the rate of the reagent collisions. So the idea behind collision theory is that for a reaction to happen, the reagents must collide. And this first postulate is saying that the more collisions, the more reaction can occur, or the faster the reaction can occur overall. And this is proportional to concentrations, right? So the more you have the more, the closer together the reagents are going to be, the easier it's going to be to, for those molecules to collide. The second postulate says that reagents must collide in the correct orientation to allow contact of the atoms that will be bonded in the products. And if you, I'm going to explain these two together here really quick, but essentially right you need an orientation to the collision. So here in the carbon monoxide mo molecule, it collided with oxygen on the oxygen side, and that did not result in a reaction. The carbon needs to be the one colliding here. See how the molecule is flipped it, with the oxygen in order for you to get the products. But just as important as having the correct orientation is having the correct energy of impact. So you, when these two molecules collide, they have to have enough energy so that their valence shells merge together and the valence electrons can uh, react, right, exchange, because that's what happens. And I think I've come up with a pretty good way of showing this with my daughter's cut-up slinky. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a terrible parent. Uh, she made an enormous knot in the slinky two minutes into having it. So I kind of rescued it for you guys. So, um, so think of these two as two molecules and they're going to meet in a reaction and react. So it's the first is kind of common sense, right? The more molecules you have, the closer together they'll be and the easier they'll meet. The second is uh, position, right? They can, they have to collide in a place where they're actually going to react. So if I have my slinkies like this, that nothing's going to happen. No matter how hard I try to merge these in, nothing's going to happen. They have to be in the right place, in the right orientation. But um, let's say you have the right orientation. It also has to have the right energy of impact. So if I take these two and just kind of, oop, that's, that's about it, that they're just going to bounce off each other and there's not much going to happen. I need to make sure that when these collide, I have enough energy in that collision so that they merge, right? So that they come together. So those are the three postulates. Now all these valence electrons are merged, they can react, they're close enough, they can exchange and then a new product would emerge. But it has to have orientation, energy, and amount, enough that they would see each other. So I hope that helps visualize this idea. And <clears throat> how much energy does that impact need in order to be able to push through and actually merge those valence shells? 
Well, that's given by the activation energy. It's kind of the activate the energy barrier that reagents must overcome in order to react. And these are two examples, right? Imagine I've seen this a lot like the the air pictures where you're jumping in the air and you're trying to catch that right that moment when you're in the air, right? So you can see that, right? The barrier is almost like a physical barrier, but we're talking here for a reagent, for a reaction as a, an energy barrier that they must overcome. And as part of that barrier, that process of going to one state to another from reagents to products, there's always this transition state that really awkward and uncomfortable position that is you can't hold for very long. And in a picture, right, it's that idea of jumping in the air, but for chemicals, it's that transition between reagent and products when some bonds are breaking and other bonds are forming. It's also called the activated complex, and you'll see that in some uh, books, textbooks. I'm not sure if Chem 101 uh, uses that terminology yet but that's referring to also activation state, or I mean transition state. And I use the symbol, this double T cross, um, to represent transition state. So if you see the symbol, that's what it means. It is the highest potential energy. So it is the most energetically unfavorable situation those molecules can be in. <clears throat> and it's impossible to isolate in most cases. Now, with more modern technologies, you can track the formation of those intermediates um, and predict what they look like, but to be, they're not stable enough because of their high energy state that you could have a jar full of intermediate or transition state, sorry. So, for example, looking now into the molecule, for that reaction we saw earlier, with carbon monoxide and oxygen, they can hit in the right place with the right energy. And when they collide, those bonds between the carbon and oxygen start coming apart and the carbon and oxygen bond starts forming anew. And then even this bond over here is going to be affected also. So <clears throat> as this carbon and uh, as these two oxygen separate. So it's kind of that transition period where there some are breaking some are forming but they're very unstable so this is kind of what it would be like to have a transition state and then they quickly rearrange into the final product they don't stay here for very long now to represent kind of the reagents the products the transition state the energy barrier these are all separate We've talked about them and defined them separately, but they all come together as property of a reaction. So we use reaction coordinates to describe kind of all that information pertaining to a chemical reaction. Um, so, for example, if I have a reaction A and B produces C and D, a reaction coordinate is going to have your y-axis and your x-axis. This is just extent of reaction. And this is going to be your potential energy. Usually we refer to it in terms of kilo, in units of kilojoules. And so your reagents and your products are going to be at the beginning or at the end. And I'm just going to draw one form of it so you kind of get an idea. So say, for example, you have your reagents. And your reagents, this is what you start with. In this case, it's A and B. And they collide. And when they collide, they must overcome an energetic barrier. And for this reaction, right, they would reach a transition state. And this distance between the tip of the transition state and this bottom where the reagents lie, that's going to be the activation energy, the energy required to get from here to here. And then as you go, as, as this transition state's not very stable, it's going to quickly then become your product, which in this case is C and D, which is your products. So the distance or the difference between the reagents and the transition state, that's what you calculate as your activation energy. And we symbolize activation energy as EA. And 
if you kind of look at what I'm saying here, right, this is energy. So this is the energy of your reagents. This is the potential energy, the chemical energy they contain. And in this case, the products here, I, I drew them just randomly, not this could have been up here, but um, I drew them so that the products in this case have a lower energy content than the reagents. And you've heard of this before because the difference between the energy contents, right, of the products and the reagents, you guys know who's coming back, delta H, the change in enthalpy, right? So look at all the information we've gotten from this reaction coordinate. Now, in the same way, and we'll discuss this in a little bit again, right, you can have reaction coordinates that look different. You can have a smaller activation energy, and you can have the products being um, higher energy content than the reagents. This is going to still be from here to here, your activation energy for the forward reaction. The difference between the reagents and the products is going to be still your delta H. This is always going to be your transition state. This is your reagents. These are your products. Okay. So for each reaction that occurs, you can have a reaction coordinate like this that describes the particular way that reaction functions. The energy it requires, the energy of the reagents, the energy of the products, and that barrier. You can also do more work describing the transition state. So using these reaction coordinates, we want to talk a little bit about properties of that activation energy or what we can see and how that relates to the other things we have actually learned already about the kinetics of a reaction. So um, here I have two postulates, a reaction with a lower activation energy is faster and is going to have a larger K. K, you guys remember what K is? K is your rate constant. Rate constant from your rate law kinetics from the last few handouts. So in this, for example, in this coordinate we have here, you have your reagents, you have your products at the end of that uh, process and you have an activation energy. This is to reach your transition state. Now you can imagine this energy barrier looks much larger than this energy barrier in this second example. So it would take a lot more for every one of these reagents to overcome this barrier. That's why the reaction is going to be slower. The higher the activation energy or that energy barrier, the slower that reaction can go because it requires more energy to overcome the barrier instead of performing the reaction. On this side of the coordinate, which is the opposite, you have a smaller barrier. So it's the reaction can cycle through faster because it has enough energy. It has more molecules with enough energy to overcome that activation barrier and make your products. So notice already we have a relationship between activation energy and your rate constant. <clears throat> if a collision, when these two molecules collide, <clears throat> when the molecules collide, they collide weakly like I showed you with the slinkies, right? Where it's not enough energy for them to actually get to that transition state. They just cycle through. They don't perform the reaction unless they meet that requirement. They must have that minimum requirement energy, that activation energy, in order to go through to the products. And one thing that you could do to kind of feed energy, as we've said before, right, kind of provide that extra energy to go over the, uh, that barrier is changing temperature, right? A higher temperature, the more temperature, the more thermal energy you're providing to your collisions. That energy translates to those molecules being able to collide with the intensity they need to get over that hump. So at lower temperatures, you might get that the activation energy is not met, and so that reaction slows down. But at a higher temperature, you can get that those collisions will now occur with enough energy in the impact 
to meet that minimum energy requirement. So we've established a relationship between temperature, your rate constant, and your activation energy. Uh, let me write that where we can see that. Now we have a relationship between temperature, right, activation energy, and your rate constant. And based on the activation energy, you can tell, right, that if your reaction is going to be faster or slower. Also, if you increase the temperature, you can increase the energy that those molecules have, therefore meeting that activation energy faster, therefore being a faster reaction. So in this example, problem two, <clears throat> if the two reactions below occur at the same temperature, which reaction coordinate represents a reaction with a larger rate constant? So see, I'm not, um, I'm showing you a reaction, co a reaction coordinate, which you know only refers to activation energy, and now I'm actually, I'm actually asking you about K, right? Um, fast or slow, <clears throat> larger k rate constant, that's k. So I'm kind of mixing the two concepts, activation energy, right, that we studied uh, now, and then kinetics from last uh, handouts. So in this case, I'm asking for a larger k. This means that I want it to be fast. I'm asking which reaction goes faster? Well, it is it going to be faster with this activation energy? or with this activation energy? Well, it's faster if it has a smaller barrier to overcome. So this reaction will be faster, it will have a larger rate constant. And here's delta H again. It keeps popping back up, guys, and it's just very useful. Delta H equals the energy difference between products and reagents. We studied this last time in thermodynamics. And you can calculate the delta H by the difference of the reagents and the products. If a reaction is endothermic, that's because the reagents have a lower energy content than the outcome products. And so you can imagine if this is the, um, the reagents where they lie, you overcome that activation barrier wherever it is, and this is your transition state. But the delta H doesn't care about this. It just cares about the beginning and the end. It just cares about where the reagent started and where the products ended. That difference is your delta H. In an exothermic reaction, you'd have that the reagents are higher content of potential energy than the products. The products have less energy or content. So, for the reaction coordinate, you would see, right, that you have an activation barrier, wherever that would be, and that goes through a transition state. But again, your delta H does not depend on this process. All it's looking at is the beginning and the end. It started with a high potential energy and it ended up with a low potential energy. The difference is negative, and that's what tells you that it is an exothermic reaction. So the reagents are higher energetic, have higher energetic content than your products. So in this example problem, it says, does this reaction coordinate correspond to an endothermic or an exothermic reaction? So we're not going to worry about the magnitude of the activation barrier. All we're going to look at is the beginning and the end. These are the reagents. These are the products. The reagents have a higher energy content than the product. So the reagent has more energy. As it goes down to the product, it releases that excess of energy. And so this reaction is exothermic. Okay, Think about it like um, moving from a more expensive apartment to a cheaper apartment. Now you have that extra income to use for other stuff. Right, so that frees up some money. So it frees, it's exothermic. Okay, it frees up that energy for you to use for something else. 
So that's exothermic. If this was inverted, right, for me to go in the opposite direction, which is exactly what we're going to talk about next, for every reaction in the forward direction, you can absolutely have a reaction in the, in the opposite direction. Now, when you have a question like this, you're always going to assume it's the forward direction. But if I were doing the opposite direction here, where these products would become what we assigned as the reagents, that process, right, would be endothermic. Because the products have to owe money, have to take in money to become reagents, right? They, the reagents are more expensive, so they have to take a loan out. So they borrow energy, they borrow heat, that's endothermic. And I really, this is a great moment to talk to you about forward and reverse reactions. In fact, we're going to do it in the next problem here, problem four. And in problem four, <clears throat> uh, you have a series of A, B, C questions. And we're going to look at this um, reaction coordinate for a little bit. In this reaction coordinate, you have values of potential energy, kilojoules, like I promised. And this is just the reaction progress. So you start with reagents. In, these, in this case, your reagent energy content is about 20 kilojoules. And as it goes from reagents to the transition state, right, the difference between the energy content of the transition state and your reagent, that's going to be your activation energy. And the difference in energy between the products and the reagents, that's your delta H. So in this case, right, when I'm going in the direction, the forward direction, they're saying, what is the enthalpy change for this reaction? So that's the first question, that's A. So the enthalpy change is always product minus reagents. Product energy content, and you can use the values on your axis, axis which is 40 kilojoules, minus, so it's the energy or the heat in the products, always minus reagents and the reagents are at 20 kilojoules so the delta h of this reaction is 20 kilojoules and notice it's positive it's endothermic right the reagents start down here and they have to take a loan to be living as a product, right? It's a higher energy. So the loan means it has to borrow energy. It's endothermic. B, what is the activation energy in the forward direction? Now I'm introducing words like forward and in the next one you're gonna see reverse. So if you see something like forward, I'm being more specific. I'm saying the direction as it's drawn, right? From reagents to products. In the forward direction, the hump, right, that the reagents start here and they have to get here. So this is the activation energy for the forward reaction. And that's going to be the transition state minus, right, the reagents where you start. So 100 kilojoules minus 20 kilojoules. That's 80 kilojoules. So this is the activation energy in the forward direction. But, and this is going to come up in the next handout right away. In the next handout, we're talking exactly about this, reversibility of reactions. And guys, I feel like I've lied to you all this time because I always show you reactions going in one direction. But the reality is that every single reaction can happen in the reverse also. I know. We'll talk more about it in the next handout. But once you have these products, these products, if they have enough energy, they can climb up this ladder too and go in that direction, believe it or not. So for this product, the energy barrier is going from here to here. That's the activation energy in the reverse, right? What is the energy these products need to get to the transition state? Well, they start at 40. And the transition state is 100 kilojoules. So the reverse 
energy barrier, right? The reverse uh, activation energy is 60 kilojoules. I know, this blows your mind. Reverse and forward, I know. But you guys will get it. Now, in addition to these reactions, we have catalyst. And I'm sure you guys have heard of catalyst in one way or another. And in your biology classes, your teachers will talk to you about enzymes and catalyst and in chemistry as you go through, for example, inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry next, we talk a lot about catalyst. Catalyst are conditions or chemicals, molecules, that will alter the speed of a reaction, will actually help them go faster. And the way that they do that is because they find an alternative pathway or an alternative to the barrier that is your activation energy. And usually, we'll talk about that a little bit more, the, remember the first postulate of the collision theory is that the more collisions, the faster the reaction can go. Half the, the work, half the torment those poor molecules have to go through is finding each other. Right? Once they find each other, they have to collide in the right direction and then they have to have enough energy of collision. So a lot of these catalysts, what they do is they accommodate the molecules that need to react. They kind of bring them closer. And we briefly talked about this in class when we were talking about zero order reactions and I mentioned catalyst. And they kind of work as that common friend that brings a couple together. They're not part of the couple, but they assisted in bringing those two people together. And that's kind of what catalysts do. And by doing that, they decrease the amount of energy required to meet that transition state. So they work in two ways. You can have catalysts that work by lowering the activation energy altogether. So if this was the normal equation, it makes it the, that requirement for the transition state lower. It decreases that um, barrier. So instead of going all the way up here from here, you only need to meet this energetic requirement. It shrinks the energetic requirement. Another way it could do is breaking a large barrier into smaller steps or smaller um, requirements. So in that case, it can have, instead of one big energetic barrier, it can break it down into two smaller steps that are much more doable by the energy content, the temperature and everything else in that reaction. And you guys are way familiar with um, catalysts. You have, you, you depend on a catalyst on a daily basis to get home, to work, to school. And you've heard probably about a catalytic converter the catalytic converter is a solid phase catalyst and what it does that's why it's called heterogeneous heterogeneous means it mix it has two different phases right two things that are different so a solid phase catalyst in this case helps uh, improve the quality of the exhaust in your vehicle by allowing the gases a place to react so that any remaining carbon monoxide that's coming out of your combustion reaction can find a place to react with oxygen and release as carbon dioxide, which as you know, is at least less bad than carbon monoxide. So it reduces significantly the amount of toxins out. And what it does is provide us a support an area where that reaction can meet each other and find each other and react. So it does more of that accommodating, helping those two um, meet. Okay. Then you have enzymes. Our life as we know it depends on it. Enzymes <clears throat> are a catalyst. And what they do is they have an area. So these are your enzymes and enzymes have what we call active sites and these active sites accommodate the substrates or the molecules that it wants to that it's going to help and so when those substrates or those molecules are swimming around the cytoplasm or swimming around these aqueous solutions 
they find these enzymes and they're strongly attracted to those active sites or those enzymes and they're drawn in and pulled they held they're held in place the two that need to come together until they react now that they see each other they can react and do what they need to do but swimming in that incredible mixture that's in your cell with all the other proteins enzymes salts molecules um, atoms it just it's hard for these to um, to find each other but they need to find a way to react so enzyme provide kind of a meeting place brings them together in a favorable condition sometimes even protected from the rest of the of the mixture that's in that area and allows them to react helps them react so those are the ways catalysts can help. So we've talked about the act, the collision theory, activation barriers, and the um, reaction coordinates. And we talked about catalysts. You should have, hopefully all this information will help you get through uh, Worksheet 10. And I'm also going through the answers on Worksheet 10 in a separate video.